Perhaps the Rolling Stones would have been more aptly named the Rolling Roulette Wheels. In fact, it's uncertain if the world would have ever heard Start Me Up had Mick Jagger's ancestor not skillfully alternated his bets between black and red. Here he is, Joseph Hobson Jagger. And this is what the Monte Carlo Casino Hall looked like in the second half of the 19th century. Imagine the scene. The croupier announces, bets have been placed, no more bets. Yet all eyes are not on the roulette wheel, but on the tall Englishman who, once again, had placed several expensive chips on numbers 7, 8, 9, and 12. He had already won a staggering sum of $10,000 for those times and calmly watched the white ball. After bouncing several times off the expensive wood of the roulette, it landed in sector 8. For the first time, the manager announced an early end to the game. The bank was exhausted. Everyone asked Jagger about his system, but he just smiled. Mathematics. The rock star's ancestor won over $300,000 in Monte Carlo, amounting to several million in today's money. In the end, this man from the English working class laid the foundations for the Jagger family's wealth. Could it be that nearly 200 years ago, numbers defeated chance and mathematics proved stronger than fortune? Overall, is it possible to become rich by being a talented accountant? Is there a formula to the game? This video was created by SumSub, the verification platform. We make the digital world people-friendly, yet secure. Once again, a casino. Once again, a crowd frozen in anticipation. And once again, a Briton who bets everything. Ashley Revel initially moves his chips valued at $135,000, his entire life savings, to black, but then changes his mind and shifts them to red. The roulette spins and... Thus, he doubled his life savings, invested in a business incidentally also related to gambling, and he became wealthy. Unlike Jagger, the rock star's ancestor, Ashley had no system and relied solely on luck. So what were his chances? Not 50-50. The casino was American, meaning the roulette wheel had not one, but two zero sectors. 38 slots in total, 18 red, 18 black, and two green sectors. Thus, the chance of winning by betting on a colour is about 47.37%. Nearly 50. Nearly. It's here that the devil in the details lurks, the one that has doomed many a gambler's soul. Let's start with the basics. The coin. The oldest and simplest gambling game in the world. Heads or tails. Is it possible to calculate your chances of winning? In the 17th century, French scientist Pascal was asked in a correspondence to calculate the probability of rolling double sixes on two dice. This idea so intrigued Pascal that he dedicated all his time to it. Thus, the theory of probability was born. How it works. The top and bottom rows are always equal to one. Each number inside the triangle is the sum of the two numbers above it on the left and right. Now let's consider how to use Pascal's triangle to determine the probability of getting three consecutive heads in coin tosses. Suppose we have a coin that can land on heads or tails with equal probability. We want to calculate the probability that, in three consecutive tosses, the coin will land on heads three times. In Pascal's triangle, the rows represent the number of tosses, and the numbers within the rows represent the number of ways to achieve a certain number of heads in that toss. For example, in the third row, the first number signifies the number of ways to get zero heads, the second number represents the number of ways to get one head, and the third number represents the number of ways to get two heads. To find the probability of getting three consecutive heads, we need to know the total number of all possible outcomes, 
2 over 3, since each toss has two possible outcomes, and the number of ways in which we can get three heads in a row. In this case, it is one way. Thus, the probability of getting three consecutive heads is 1 eighth, or 0 0.125. According to probability theory, if we flip a coin multiple times, the number of heads and tails should approach a uniform distribution over time, provided the coin is fair and tossed randomly. Over a short distance, it's possible to get 10 heads in a row, but the probability of this happening is minuscule. It's even less likely to win on a roulette wheel, even a European one with only one zero. Could it be that Jagger from the 19th century really knew more than mathematicians? However, the system of the Englishman was much simpler to explain. If you've read Jack London's Smoke Bellow, whose prototype was the elder Jagger, you might have guessed already. He worked as a mechanical engineer in a cotton mill. Thanks to his knowledge about the mechanisms used in cotton production, he hypothesized that all roulette wheels, being slightly different due to minor defects in their design, should have certain numbers coming up more often than others. Jagger hired several people to watch the roulette wheels at a Monte Carlo casino. After analyzing the results, he figured out which numbers appeared most frequently and placed large bets on them. That's all there was to the high-level mathematics. However, attempts to develop a scientifically sound roulette betting system have been made as long as the game has existed. Here are the most popular ones. Martingale. This is one of the most famous betting management systems. You need to double your bet after every loss to cover the losses and make a profit when a win finally occurs. But you'll need a lot of money. Reverse Martingale. In this strategy, the player doubles their bet after each win. Fibonacci Strategy. Just to remind, this is a sequence where the first two numbers are zero and one and each subsequent number is the sum of the two preceding ones. The idea behind the Fibonacci strategy in roulette is to use these numbers as bets. Each bet in this strategy is determined by the sum of the two previous numbers in the sequence. For example, we start with the first two numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. The first bet is one, one plus zero. If the bet is lost, we add the next number in the sequence and get the sum of the new bet. If this bet is lost, the next bet will be 2, 1 plus 1. The process continues until the player wins, and after winning, the next bet rolls back two Fibonacci numbers. So if the bet 2 wins, we will place 1 again. We balance the losses. Labouchier. The player splits a sequence of numbers into two parts, takes the sum of the extreme numbers and makes a roulette bet with his sum. For example, start by choosing a sequence of numbers, such as 1, 2, 3, 4. This can be any sequence of numbers, depending on your preference and bankroll. The sum of the first and last digits in your sequence determines your initial bet. In this case, it will be 1 plus 4 equaling 5. Place a bet on the roulette wheel equal to the sum of the first and last digits in your sequence. In this case, it will be 5. If your bet is a winning one, you win five. You cross out both of these digits from your sequence and move on to the next two numbers. In this case, it will be two, three. If your bet loses, you add the amount of your losing bet to the end of your sequence. In this case, if you lose five, your sequence will become one, two, three, four, five. Continue this process until you cross out all numbers from the sequence or until your bankroll is exhausted. De Lambert system. In this strategy, the player increases or decreases their bets by one unit after each loss or win, respectively. This assumes that there will be an approximately equal number of wins and losses over the course of the game. Spoiler! None of these systems are mathematically successful. You will lose everything if you play long enough. Thousands have lost. And if you want to be sure of winning, Meet Tommy Carmichael, in some sense a legend of the gaming industry. For two decades, he did what every gambler dreams of, bankrupting casinos. His income was in the millions of dollars, and the devices he constructed were laughably simple. 
Carmichael modified standard coin acceptors on slot machines, inserting a device capable of pushing the coin back out. Thus, the slot machines thought a coin was inserted while it remained with Carmichael. He could reuse the coin, gaining credits on his account and winning without losing any of his own funds. But his most legendary invention was the monkey paw, literally a wire on a stick which completed a circuit, causing slot machines to continuously give out jackpots. His entire biography is practically an illustration of the battle between gambling hackers and the gaming industry. They built a wall and he found a loophole. In the end, he made a profit of $45 million. And if it weren't for an irresponsible friend, he might have gotten away with it. But Carmichael was caught, served time, and now advises those he used to bankrupt. What if the hacker is part of the gaming system itself? Ron Harris, in the early 90s, was a programmer for the Nevada Gaming Control Board and was responsible for finding holes in software. He found them. He wrote code that made some slot machines give out jackpots if coins were inserted in a specific order. Along with accomplices, he won hundreds of thousands of dollars. They would have gotten away with it if it weren't for greed. Citizen Kane and Video Poker It's still unclear whether John was just lucky or knew something, but he and his friend were incredibly lucky. They could spend hours betting a penny, but due to a system bug, they were able to raise the bet to $10 during a good hand, winning tens of thousands. The casino eventually caught them, but couldn't prove any wrongdoing. By the way, among online gamblers, there are no legends quite like Tony Carmichael. Well, as far as we know. At SumSub, we've discovered that online casino fraudsters tend to favor certain schemes to manipulate the system. For instance, arbitrage betting. This is when bets are placed on all possible outcomes of sporting events, ensuring a guaranteed profit. This somewhat resembles the strategy of some charming elderly folks who made $27 million on the lottery by purchasing several thousand tickets. You'll learn more about them a bit later. Additionally, your account could simply be compromised and the hacker may try their luck on your behalf. Hackers, too, enjoy games. Fraudsters can also purchase genuine documents on the darknet and use them to gamble undetected in someone else's name. Some subs player verification system makes all these fraud schemes impossible. Our full cycle verification and player risk profiling system is designed for the iGaming industry. To quickly identify suspicious behavior, we rely on an AI-based player risk profiling and analysis module. It detects risky behavior using dynamic scores that flag suspicious activities through play and spend behavioral patterns, such as deposit frequency or average bet amount and customizable rules. Thanks to this classic movie, the term Rain Man has become commonplace. Scientifically, such people are often called savants. They struggle with socialization and require special treatment but many possess extraordinary abilities, such as incredible photographic memory. They can track, in real time, for instance, all the played cards and those remaining in the deck. Can only a birth-given trait help in the battle against the casino? No. Now watch the hands. This is the smiling, wealthy, but most importantly, very smart mathematician, Edward Thor. He began his confrontation with casinos partly like Jagger, partly like the inventor of the monkey paw. Here's his colleague and ally, mathematician Claude Shannon. They met at university over a shared love of mathematics and gambling. They tried to find a scientific solution to help win at casinos. And so, half a century before the Apple Watch, there was the wearable computer, whose task was to predict where the roulette ball would land. And this is how their invention worked. A microcomputer embedded in the shoe sole, sensing the vibrations from the roulette ball's impact, would signal through a wired headset using melodies, the sector where the winning number was most likely to be. It wasn't a 100% guarantee, 
The problem was in the last stage of the rotation, where the ball's movements were chaotic. But even with such adjustments, Thorpe and Shannon's computer gave players an unprecedented advantage. However, the mathematicians were less interested in winning or money itself. They were after the algorithm of science triumphing over randomness. And Thorpe found it. Now, pay close attention. An old and very simple card game. 21. Blackjack. Here are the basic rules. The goal is to gather cards with a total close to 21, without exceeding this number, and also to beat the dealer. Cards from 2 to 10 are valued at their face value. Jack, Queen and King are worth 10 points each. The ace can count as either 1 or 11, depending on the situation. The player and dealer each receive two cards. The player sees both their cards and only one of the dealer cards. The player has several options. Stand. Take no more cards. Hit. Take another card. Double down. Double the bet and receive only one additional card for the extra bet. Split. If the player has two identical cards, they can split them into two separate hands, placing an additional bet equal to the original bet. If the player's total exceeds 21, they lose or bust. The dealer must continue to take cards until their total reaches 17 or more. After that, they must stand. The player wins if their card total is closer to 21 than the dealer's, or if the dealer busts. Important to note though, blackjack is a combination of an ace and a 10 value card. If the player gets a blackjack right after the deal, they usually win more, usually 1.5 times the bet. Let's conduct an experiment. We have $500 in chips. The minimum bet is $25. How quickly will we lose it? Honestly, no strategy. Played by beginners. You can have a time lapse with a stopwatch to see how quickly the bankroll is lost. Quite indicative. A casual visitor to a casino will lose very quickly at 21. Psychologically, it may seem to them that their luck is just around the corner. They will increase their bets, trying to recoup what is already lost, and will lose even faster and more. But blackjack, unlike roulette, is not purely a game of chance. Cards are numbers, a limited array of them. Mathematical laws apply to them. And Thorpe realized that an algorithm could be created to help win. Thorpe found out that more nines, tens, which also include queens, kings, and jacks, and aces remain in the deck, the better for the player. He developed several card counting strategies. Thorpe's system is called high-low because it assigns values to the cards. Cards from two to six are considered low and are given a value of plus one. Cards seven, eight, and nine are considered neutral and have a value of zero while tens, jacks, queens, kings, and aces are considered high and have a value of minus one. In 1960, he finally devised the optimal winning strategy, counting tens. To understand if they have an advantage, the player keeps track of the ratio of other cards to tens. In a full deck, there are 16 tens and 36 other cards. 36, 16 equals 2.25. The higher the count, the more high cards remain in the deck. Players call this a hot shoe. As soon as the deck heats up, it's time to make large bets. And while it's cold, play the minimum. Using this system, a player usually wins most of the large bets and eventually makes a profit, even though they may lose most of the small bets in unfavorable situations during the game. In 1961, Thorpe published his article on how to win at blackjack. However, the theory needed to be tested. The mathematician obtained financial backing from two multimillionaires with controversial biographies, and after training, they went to play in Nevada. Successfully. Eventually, their casino tour ended in victory. In 30 hours, the player's capital grew from $10,000 to $21,000. Then Thorpe wrote the Gambler's Bible, Beat the Dealer, which instantly became a bestseller. The book caused panic in the gambling business, Players who had read it flooded the casinos, and many started to win indeed. 
Casino owners had to learn to identify such mathematicians and ban them from playing. But let's repeat our blackjack experiment and try to act according to Thorpe's high-low method. Disclaimer. Of course, we conduct the experiment in ideal conditions, in silence and with maximum concentration. At a real gambling table, you will be distracted by many factors. Noise, other players, waitresses bustling with drinks, and you must not miss a single card, constantly subtracting and adding in your mind. Otherwise, the deck play can be considered meaningless. The conclusion. Thorpe claimed that proper use of his system gives the player an advantage over the casino, ranging from 0.5 to 1.5%. It's not a panacea, but in the long run and with a large bankroll, a player can expect a good profit. It's difficult for solo players to amass a large sum, but if a team plays, You've probably seen this movie, 21 starring Kevin Spacey as a university professor who assembled a team of his best students, winning millions of dollars in blackjack at American casinos. This is what the MIT blackjack team looked like. The mathematicians based their method on Thorpe's high-low system, but refined it. Team members performed different functions to maximally conceal their collective play from casino management. Someone warmed up the deck with small bets, while another member counted cards. As soon as the count indicated the right sum, a third member would join in and start playing large bets, often taking a big win. Here is team founder Bill Kaplan speaking to Harvard students. My perspective was, was in terms of looking at running blackjack as a business, which is really what we did. Remember Thorpe's 0.5 to 1.5% advantage over the casino? To turn these small bonuses into big money, you need a large bankroll. That means investors. Here's how another team member, Michael Ponte, recalls them. Now, when I was recruited to join the MIT team, it was a startup company called Strategic Investments, a limited partnership with three founding partners who were also the managers of the team. The team toured casinos along the East Coast and later started playing in Las Vegas. Everything happened as Thorpe had predicted. With a large bankroll and strict adherence to counting rules, the students and teachers were able to turn a small advantage over the casino into huge money. The exact amount won by the team over 15 years is not disclosed, ranging from several hundred thousand to $10 million. The 2008 movie diverged from reality in this aspect. In real life, the players never rented luxurious rooms or splurged on caviar and champagne. The mathematicians behaved as quietly as possible to avoid catching the attention of casino security services. In the 90s, being caught wasn't just a matter of being asked to leave. It could end much worse. The story of the MIT Blackjack team ended in 2000, but the mathematicians had many followers. It must be clarified, card counting is not a crime, although casino owners might sometimes say otherwise. It's not cheating. You are using your abilities within the rules. However, since the MIT team, casinos have implemented many technologies to track card counters. A casino can refuse to let you play without explaining why, or by saying, you're too good a player for us. I started playing the lottery when it came to Florida, which was about 25 years ago. And it took me a few years to start developing some things that helped me win more often. And then eventually I won my first, my second, third, and here we are today, I've now won seven lottery game grand prizes. Is it statistically possible to be as lucky as Richard Lustig? He claims to have won seven times. Lustig was so eager for everyone to be lucky that he wrote a book on how to beat randomness. The book became a bestseller. However, critics had many questions for the lucky man. He did not provide sufficiently convincing evidence of his claims about multiple lottery wins. He didn't show copies of winning tickets. Some critics consider his book more of a marketing move than a real guide to winning. Of course, tomorrow night's jackpot, you have heard by now, $700 million. It is the country's largest jackpot ever. I just asked you, do you play any different when you see this kind of number? No. And you said no. No, I don't know. I play the same. I play the same. Well, I never buy tickets unless it gets up like 100, 200 million. It's like, what, 40 million isn't enough right. for you? That's
Mathematicians also doubt the effectiveness of the methods and strategies proposed by Richard. They point out that lotteries are primarily games of chance, and no methods can guarantee success. The fabulously lucky Lustig died in 2018, literally taking the secret with him to the grave. Let's count again. If 5 million people participate in a lottery, the chance of winning by buying one ticket depends on the total number of tickets and the number of winning combinations. Suppose it's a 6 out of 49 lottery, where the win is determined by matching all six numbers. Suppose each of the 5 million people bought one ticket, then the total number of tickets would be 5 million. In a 6 out of 49 lottery, there is only one winning combination. A win occurs when all six numbers on the ticket match the winning combination. The number of ways to guess six numbers out of 49 is calculated by this formula. Then the probability of winning will be this. To calculate the probability of winning, we first need to find the number of possible combinations of six numbers out of 49. And then take the reciprocal of this number. We have calculated the probability of winning for you to be approximately like this. Thus, the chance of winning a lottery with 5 million participants, buying one ticket, is very low. We won't even make analogies with the likelihood of being struck by lightning twice. Found this flaw. There's a loophole that the lottery didn't see. It's right here in the math. Attention! Walter White, or rather Jerry, finds a way to earn for his family again. The movie Jerry and Marge Go Large tells how a retiree from rural America spotted a bug in the draw of a new lottery. Of course, the film is based on real events. Here they are, Jerry and Marge Selby. Their approach was based on analyzing the structure of the lottery game called Winfall, which offered high stakes and rewards. Jerry, with a degree in mathematics, noticed the peculiarities of this lottery which involved accumulating the prize pool up to a certain limit and then distributing the winnings among tickets participating in subsequent draws. And I read it, and by the time I was out here, I knew what the potential might be. It did not take you weeks to suss this out. No, no, not at all. Three minutes. Three minutes, and you've uh, found the loophole in the three, state line. Three minutes. I found a, I found a special feature. <laughs> Jerry and Marge discovered that when the prize pool reached a certain level, the probability of winning became significantly higher than usual. They developed a strategy that included buying a large number of tickets when the prize pool was high, which allowed them to increase their chances of winning. Their strategy proved effective, and they won millions of dollars. After their method became known, the state of Michigan made changes to the game rules to prevent further use of such strategies. However, the stories of Jerry and Marge as well as teams of mathematicians bankrupting casinos, are not just rare, but rather a mathematical aberration. Any business built on exploiting human gambling is built on a model inherently disadvantageous for the player. Remember, the house always wins. <laughs>